What's up guys, in this video, I wanna go through a quick review of simplifying rational expressions, just like I would inside the classroom if my students were taking a test the next day. I'm gonna highlight some pieces of information that you need to know, as well as work through some concrete examples. So if you're cramming for a test or you're just looking for a quick review, then this is the video for you. Let's get into it. Okay, now the first thing I always like to describe or discuss with students when are talking about simplifying rational expressions is to understand the division property. Now remember the division property says whenever you have a term or an expression in the numerator as well as in the denominator that is separated by multiplication, then you can divide those terms out or it's equal to one. We all know five divided by five is equal to one, right? So we have five divided by five equal to one, but again, variable or expression x divided by x is also equal to one. So this is equal to one. Now, sometimes students will get this confused because you're like, well, the x and the five are not separated by multiplication. You're right, they're separated by addition. You cannot apply the division property across addition or subtraction. But in this case, since these are actually the exact same expressions, this answer is still going to be one. Now let's kind of get into where are some mistakes then that students will make. So for example, if I was to take like this x plus five divided by five or x plus five divided by x, here we cannot apply the division property. Right? I cannot divide the five with the five because this five is being separated by x with addition. So this is just going to remain exactly as it is. The exact same thing here. I cannot divide out these x's. Now again, if I put a x times a x plus five, now ladies and gentlemen, the expression x is being separated by the expression x plus five with multiplication. So now I can go ahead and apply the division property. Same thing works like this. If I had five times x plus five all over five, now my five is being separated with the x plus five expression, so therefore now I can go and apply the division property. A lot of times we use this line and we say the words cancel out, but in reality all it's simply doing is just dividing things out to one, okay? So that is our general idea for applying the division property. Now let's get into some examples because this is where a lot of students make mistakes. Now, the reason why students make mistakes is because of factoring, 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 and then also understanding the discontinuity. So I'm gonna get into that on this first example. Now, this one for factoring is really not that bad. You guys can see this is, actually, you know what? I'm gonna change this problem just one little bit here, a little bit. I'm actually gonna change this to a six. The reason why I wanna change this to six is because again, students see the same number in the numerator and the denominator. What do they wanna do? They wanna divide them out. And no, ladies and gentlemen, do not go ahead and divide those out. What we always wanna do, step number one, is simplify. Always wanna to look to be able to factor, 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 okay? Now, in this numerator, I can actually factor out a common factor of two from the two x and the six. So, when I go ahead and do that, I factor out my two, Basically, you think of like dividing both those terms by two, I'm gonna be left with an x minus a three divided by a six x, right? Now, you can see that I can divide a two over six, I can reduce that over to a one third. So I'm left with the expression x minus three divided by a three x. And again, I know you see a three in the numerator and denominator, I know you see an x in the numerator and denominator, but again, these terms are separated by subtraction, so we can no longer further divide that, okay? However, now what we need to do is determine what are our undefined values. So when we're looking for our undefined values, we can just actually go back into our original term because even when things get divided out, what I want you to be able to see is just because they got divided out doesn't mean they're not, they're still not going to be values that are not going to be defined. I'm missing up my words. But anyways, what we want to be able to do is determine what are the values that are not defined for this expression. And the values that we're looking for are the values that are going to make your denominator equal to zero. So we don't need to worry about our simplified version. We can go back to our original problem. The numbers that are going to make my denominator zero are, we simply just take our denominator, so we'll say a 6x is equal to zero. Now go ahead and solve for uh, x divided by 6 on both sides, x is equal to zero. So in this original equation, I know x cannot equal zero because again, you can't divide by zero. And if you want to think about that and you say, well, what do you mean you can't divide by zero? Well, let's just think about this. Let's say x, let's say you divide by zero equals some answer a, right? x divided by zero equals some answer a. Well, if you were to solve for x, you'd multiply by zero on both sides. x equals an a times zero, or put it this way. Let's do this. Let's say you could take the number five and divide it by zero, right? Let's say you have a number, forget x. Let's say we have five. Five divided by zero equals some number a. Well, if you multiply by zero on both sides, you get five equals a times zero. Ladies and gentlemen, we know anything times zero is equal to zero. Right, so this doesn't make any sense, right? We cannot divide by zero. So therefore we say x cannot equal zero, and then we can bring that down to our original, our original expression, 
x cannot equal 0, because again, 0 is still going to make my denominator undefined. So therefore, I'll just write in this uh, undefined term, x cannot equal 0. All right, on this next example, again, first thing I always want to do is simplify. Factor, 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 right? So we notice up here up top, we have a difference of two squares. So I can rewrite that as an x minus 2 times an x plus 2. In the denominator, I'm thinking what two numbers multiply to give me 8, but then are going to add to give me 6. I'm thinking of the factors of 8. I'll be like 8 and 1, 4 and 2. And then I immediately know, oh, well, if they have to add to give me a 6, I know 4 and 2 are going to work. Since this is positive, I know it's both going to be an x plus 4 and an x plus 2. Okay, now again, it's very, very important to understand here a couple things. One, what are the values that are going to make this expression equal to 0? It's a lot easier to find them when it's in factored form rather than the original expression, right? I know the values that are going to make this 0 would be x cannot equal a negative 2, because if I plug a negative 2 in for here, negative 2 plus 2 is 0. 0 times anything is 0. And I know that negative 4, because negative 4 plus 4 is 0. And again, that would make everything 0. So x cannot equal negative 2 and negative 4. But now let's go and get into the simplifying process. Look over here. These expressions are separated by multiplication. Again, when things are separated by multiplication, we know we can apply the division property. x plus 2 and x plus 2 are exactly the same. So we can say they divide out. So therefore, my simplified expression is an x minus 2 all over an x plus 4. However, we still need to have this restriction from our original problem. So therefore, we're going to keep that as an x cannot equal a negative 2 and an x cannot equal a negative 4. All right, so in this problem, again, we just have trinomial over trinomial. So again, ladies and gentlemen, it just comes into go ahead and, and you know, working through all of the factoring process. So hopefully you recognize up here, this is a square number. So again, I'm immediately going to think of perfect square trinomials. So therefore, I can factor that into a x plus 3 times a x plus 3. Now, a lot of times we'd write that as an x plus 3 quantity squared. However, when we're doing it this way, I would probably prefer you leave it in this expanded form because there's some mistakes that can happen. Now, if we factor this one, what two numbers multiply to give me a negative 12, add to give me a negative 1. So again, I'm looking to, for two factors that have a difference of 1. 4 and 3 are kind of sticking out to me. Since my middle term is negative, I know the larger factor has to be negative. So that'd be an x minus 4 times an x plus 3. And the reason being that a lot of students will make mistakes is if I wrote it like this, sometimes what students will do is they'll forget that numerator is squared. So they'll divide the terms like that. But remember, x plus 3 quantity squared means is x plus 3 times x plus 3. So these terms are actually going to go ahead and divide out. So now I'm going to have a simplified version of x plus 3 over an x minus 4. But we still need to keep in, in form of our original discontinuities. So x cannot equal a positive 4 and a negative 3. All right, now we're into our favorite type of example, factoring when a is not equal to 1. Now, again, a big misconception that a lot of students will do is, again, trying to see that numbers that they can divide, right? 6 and 18, reducing that, or dividing out to 3s. No, ladies and gentlemen, we can only do that when we have the exact same terms, which are separated by multiplication divide, division. And again, students will see, well, these are multiplied by a multiplication, and that is technically correct. But again, we can't apply that division property because we have these other terms with separated are going to be by division. So what I need to do is look into how can I factor out these terms. And to go ahead and do that, the first thing I recognize to see is, is there anything that they have in common? Now, up top here, I don't have anything in common. But down below, you can see these are all divisible by 3. So I can go ahead and factor out a 3 here in this denominator. And that's going to leave me with a x squared plus a 5x plus a 6. Okay, so I think that should be factorable. And then over here, what I'm looking at is saying, all right, I know a quadratic trinomial can be broken down into a product of two binomials, right? If I'm going to multiply to give me 3, I can use a 3x and an x. And then I need to think of the factors that are going to give me 6. Now, I don't want to multiply this 3 times 6 because that's going to give me 18. Everything's positive, right? So when I'm multiplying these products, this outer and the inner, I need them to combine to 18. So I don't want to multiply by 6. And if I multiply by a 1, that'd be 3, 6, 9. That's not going to work. So I'm thinking this is going to be a 3 and a 2. That sounds about right. Because if I put a 3 over here, 3x times not 3 would be a positive uh, 9. And then if I had a plus 2 here, 2 times x, 2x plus 9, 9x would be an 11x. So you can see that works out there. Now let's go and factor down this denominator. So I have a 3x plus 2 times an x plus 3. And then over here, I can break that down into, don't forget the scalar, 3, x plus 2 times a x plus 3, right? And then again, you can see, guys, these are separated. Now everything's broken down to multiplication. So we can break those part, parts. 
So I have a 3x plus 2 divided by 3 times x plus 2. But again, going back to our undefined terms, we know that x cannot equal a negative 2. And per our original equation, x cannot equal a negative 3. Now that you hopefully have a general idea of how to apply simplifying rational expressions, guess what? We're going to expand upon this in the next video where we're going to work on multiplying and dividing rational expressions. It's all coming up next for you.